we have been dealing with inflation. We have been dealing with inflation. Can I get an amen? Now, I know you didn't come to church to talk about inflation, but in case you didn't know what that was, it's the gradual increase in the cost of goods and services over a period of time in an economy. I know you already knew all that, but that said, some of us are feeling that more than others, and it's been something that this nation has been experiencing for the last couple of years in particular in a way that we hadn't before. Just ask somebody who bought a home this year and had sold a home with a 3% lower interest rate. And I went, oh Lord, I'm feeling the effects of the inflation. You pay more for less, right? You pay more for less. But in the community of faith, in the house of the Lord, in our faith, inflation might be a different matter. It's maybe not what you think it is. Inflation that we want to be mindful and keenly aware of and talk with one another about and complain about as much as we would the financial inflation might be happening in our nation would be when we overinflate things that should be kept in moderation and when we fail to allow things to rise and to grow that need to be elevated in our lives. There are some things that need inflating in our lives and our practices of faith. And there's other things, because we allow them to rise, they actually create a recession of spiritual well-being within our lives and within our hearts. And so today we begin a sermon series called Inflation. And I won't disguise the fact, it's a stewardship sermon series. Today we're talking about our resources. Don't worry, the other weeks we're not. But this week we are. And if you're here for the first time, God bless you. This is not just a matter of whether or not you're giving a certain amount of money to this church or another church. This is a spiritual matter that we want to talk about today. And so we turn in our gospel lesson this morning. We heard Susan share with us this passage from the gospel of Mark chapter 12 about an experience that Jesus has with his disciples. He's gone to the temple. And in the temple, the place where they're gathering and and where he's teaching them thing after thing and occasionally performing miracles and signs and wonders. They, they've chosen to gather near the treasury. And there, around the treasury, there, um, there are these 12 trumpet-looking vessels made of bronze that the people are coming and placing their tithes and their offerings into holding to uh, the, the scriptures from earlier days of the importance of people of faith, of the Jewish faith, of giving the first fruits of what they've received in the world. That, that they need to give those not for their own use, but to the glory of God and for the purposes of God's community of faith. And so they bring them to the temple to enable the temple to, to sustain, to, to reach people, to offer worship, to offer ministries, to offer missions in their community. People are coming, many people are coming, and they're dropping them in. They're, they're bringing bags and bags of coins. And Jesus says some are coming with large sums, and they bring it over to the offering, and they drop it into the vessel. Some bring whole bags and, and empty them or drop them within. Jesus says that some are bringing large sums. But Jesus has his eye out on a different person. She's not named. We only know her as the widow. It was a poor, older woman. And she comes to one of those vessels. She approaches it as people are putting in so much. And she has two small copper coins together worth a penny, the scriptures tell us, or the equivalent of that in that time. And she meagerly drops those two. Perhaps she has a bag and maybe she opens it up to see what she has. And as she opens it, there's nothing more inside. And she looks at it, and then she drops both of those coins into the pipe, into the vessel. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, do you see this woman? Do you see this widow and her might, her widow's might, what she's just contributed? He says, surely I tell you, she has given more than all of these who have given large sums. She has given more than all of these who have given large sums. This is the story of the widow's might. Maybe you know it. You didn't need me to retell it. But it's important to us. It's, it's one of those foundational stories of our faith when it comes to resources and how we look at them. Jesus looks at this woman. First of all, he knows all that she has. 
He's aware of her means. He can see inside her bank account. And although she came that day without a QR code or a pledge card, she did come with these two coins. And Jesus says that when she offered that, she offered all that she had left. All she had left to live on. And we might say, keep one of the coins. (laughs) You know, or maybe both of them. And yet, what Jesus is doing here is he's celebrating and inflating the responsibility that as people of faith, we need to be a people of generosity. That we need to be a people who recognize that there is an importance in our life that we might be actually enriched by giving and doing so with with a cheerful heart, as the scripture tells us. Giving not meagerly, but giving robustly. Giving generously. Giving more giving all. The disciples hear this. Judas among them. How do you think Judas responds? I'm sure he's pulling his hair out. We we're told in the scriptures that Judas was the keeper of the purse. No matter how much he had, it was never enough. What does he end up doing? He ends up betraying our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus goes on to the cross. He, he, he goes to the cross and he, he's willing to his, his life be laid down. All that he is and all that he has devoted that we might know the love of God, and the richness of our Lord, the generosity of the Almighty God. Generosity is, is not paying somebody what they deserve or have earned. It's going beyond It's recognizing that I have no obligation to provide, and yet I'm going to do so. That widows might, according to the biblical law, should have kept both of those coins. And yet she was generous. She went beyond the legal limit. She went beyond what was required of her. She stepped into a place of generosity. She inflated generosity, and it was good for her. Jesus proposes to us that she was rich, even while others there had far more resources. In contrast to this, we have in the book of Acts, chapter 5, a story uh, of the early church community. And in the in-between, Jesus has has died and be raised, and he comes and he says, "I, I, I came to give you life and give it abundantly. He laid down his life for all of humanity that we may know God's grace. This is not something you and I deserve. This is God's generosity. And then the early church community, they had heard what Jesus said about money and about dedicating their lives and about God's generosity and God's faithfulness to us, and they started living lives that are really remarkable. People who the day before were not living with generous generosity or not caring about the, the widow or the orphan, they, their hearts were changed as they accepted Christ into their lives and they started living that way. And the, God, and the book of Acts were told that they, they came together and they sold property so that, so that they would hold in common and live together. That there was none in hunger in their communities at all because they ensured that there would not be, that they lived this way. Now, was this a government mandate? No, it was not. Was this out of generosity? Yes, it was. This was by their own volition. They chose to live this way. Nobody was requiring it. It was something that they chose to do in response to Christ entering into their lives. They couldn't help but respond to the generosity of the Lord in their life through God's grace, God's salvation, by responding, by actually doing the things Jesus had said, which was to love your neighbor as yourself. And remember, Jesus says, you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. As you've not done it unto the least of these, you've not done it unto me. In fact, Jesus talks about resources over and over and over again because he, he is telling us this truth that where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. And so the community, they're doing remarkable things. It's, it's a beautiful and powerful witness. But their own volition that if they have, one co- they have two coats, they would sell one or give the one away to somebody else. They're like, I got a coat. I'm good. Would I like two coats? Yes. But do I need two coats? No. And that brother and sister in Christ is shivering. Or that person, not of our faith, is in need. And I'm going to respond to that. This is how the early church was. And so there was um, a sense of, of joy 
a sense of pride, but not an inflated pride, a humble pride and joy in seeing the miraculous work of the Lord going on around them. And some people looked at this and said, wow, I sure would love to be looked at like those people are being looked at. Wouldn't it be amazing if everybody came to us and said, oh, you are so generous. And so there was this guy named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. And they get together and they go, you know, we have some extra property. Let's sell one of our pieces of property and, uh, you know, give it to the church. And they're thinking about it and they're thinking about it. And they're like, yeah, or we tell them we're going to give it to the church. How about this? How about we tell them we've sold property and we've given all the proceeds to the fledgling early church and everybody will just be like, aren't you the best? And we'll keep a good portion of it but not let them know. Now, were they obligated to sell the property? No. If they did sell the property, could they keep all of it for themselves? Yes! But they do something worse. They pretend generosity. And so they come to Peter. And after talking to each other, Sapphira and Ananias, they talk, they sell the property, they take the resources, they divide off their significant share, and then they take the amount that they propose to be the full amount of the sale of that property. And Ananias comes in front of Peter, and he says, Peter, I bring to you the sale of my property like so many who have gone before. Now, I, I, my wife and I are chosen to contribute all of this. And Peter is gifted with the insight of the Holy Spirit. And it's a bad day for Ananias. Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the proceeds of the land? We could say, why has, the, why has Satan inflated your heart? to lie. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? Peter is asking realistic, reasonable questions now. And he goes, how is it that you have contrived, contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us. You lied to God. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And when Ananias heard this, he fell to the ground and died. Dear Lord. <laughs> Noted, Lord. <laughs> Story doesn't end there. They take him. They wrap his body. They carry him out for burial. In comes Sapphira, his wife. She says, does my husband, does he give all the money? And Peter interrupts, and he asks her, tell me, whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price that has been given to me. And she goes, yes, that was it. That was all of it. That was the full price. She doesn't just go along. She, she contributes to this lie of her own volition. And Peter says, how is it you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Your poor husband has just died, fallen dead due to this lie. And with this, she falls down, and she's dead as well. Dear Lord, maybe not a Sunday school lesson for children. Maybe nothing you've ever heard on a consecration or stewardship Sunday before. It should be treated with kid's glove, because it's, you know. What we're not saying here is that if you've ever not given everything to the Lord, you're go God's going to strike you dead. That is not what the scripture is about. There were many, many people who gave a portion or little or significant sums. It goes back to the widow's might. Jesus expects how much of us? Are we called to just give a tithe? I mean, you're, you're invited to give a tithe of your finances, but Jesus wants your whole heart. He wants my whole heart. And often I divide it between the things that I say, oh, these things for God and these things are for me. And God's like, yeah, no, I'm the Lord of it all. Make sure that all that you have and all that you do is a glorifying thing to the Almighty. That doesn't mean that God wants us to live in poverty or scarcity. God doesn't want scarcity for us. God wants us to live in abundance, but also God also wants us to experience the abundant life that is a life of generosity. 
Ananias and Sapphira were robbing themselves. They were hurting their own witness, but they were, they were harming themselves, and they were the ones who suffered in the midst of this. And the lesson here, among other things, is one, number one, God does see inside of our bank accounts. God knows how much we have. God's insight is into the scope of everything. And so when we tell ourselves, well, I can't, or I don't have for this, because God knows, yeah, but you just did that, or you're planning for that, or you're holding on as if the greatest security you can have in this life is financial, and it's not. It's not that it's not important. It's just your salvation matters way more. It you have beyond this life. It is life with God eternally. And so if we want to live in relation with God eternally, maybe be more like Christ, who, who gives of himself with joy and love, even when others do not deserve it. John Wesley, the co-founder of our Methodist movement, when uh, he was preaching on financial giving, he said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Are you familiar with that phrase? Whew, that's in stark contrast to what some churches teach, and, but I love that. He's like saying, listen, it's not e money is not evil. Resources, just because you're wealthy, it's not, you're not evil necessarily. How, how is it with your heart? John Wesley, when he was young, he lived on something like 23 pounds a year or something like that. When he was older, and he was the, the best bookseller in England's history at that point when he was in his 80s, and he had preached from place to place, and people had been generous to him, and, but he had made resources based upon the book sales and the other things, and, and, uh, and, you know, when he was dying, he was still living on the same amount of money that he, he was living on when he was a young man. He had grown to be the equivalent of a millionaire, but he was still living on that because he figured out, I can live on this. I can live on that 23 pounds a year. And so as he continued to make more and more and more, he goes, praise the Lord with it, and let me serve the Lord with it. And so he gave the rest away. Have you ever tasted the generosity of others? Have you been a recipient of generosity? If you have, you know it, it sticks with you. It's clearly something of God. When people who, who are not obligated in any way Prov help provide for a need that you experience, there is a beauty in that. And I want to invite you to be that person. And I ask the Lord to convict my heart and change me to be more like that. And I pray the Lord would do the same with, for you. Can I tell you a short story about myself? When I was in college, I was putting my way, myself through college. My parents, my dad was a pastor, mom was a teacher. Enough said, right? Three kids. Good luck. How are you going to do it, right? You know? and, um, and so, you know, we chose schools. We tried to get scholarships, got grants, got a lot of loans. And I'm, I made it through the, my freshman year, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, well, you know, I can't, I can't have money to enroll in a fraternity or, or do this or do that, but I can, I can make it. And I got into my sophomore year, and frankly, I was really concerned that I was not going to be able to continue as a student because I wasn't going to be able to pay the bills. And, um, and I was wrestling. And honestly, you know, I didn't stress as much about the tuition, <laughs> although it was much bigger than the uh, side things. What got to me, though, was, you know, seeing my, you know, roommates and others order pizza and, and going out and having fun and, and spending a few dollars on this or a few dollars on that. And I was like, you know, I just, that I could not do. And, and it was frustrating. And in time, I was like, you know, and you know, you know what that can do? It can create a problem of greed. It can inflate greed. So you've got to be careful in those moments, right? You, you can be poor or rich and have a problem with greed. Amen? And you can also be poor or rich and be generous. I went and I, I was in my uh, chaplain's office. His name is Daryl Hedrick. He was the chaplain at Randolph-Macon College, my alma mater which Bert Sickley also graduated from, by the way. We both are uh, alumni of Randolph-Macon College. It's all okay school. Um, and I'm, I'm, I went and I talked to the chaplain, and, um, and I said, listen, like, I, and I just started talking. He's like, what's going on? What's, what's up with you? Are you okay, Matthew? What's going on? And I just started spilling, you know, as people do when they're holding on to things, and somebody finally says, yeah, release. Let, let, let me know what's going on. And I just shared some of that, and... 
And there, you know, he pulls out his wallet under the desk and comes over and he prays for me. And he says, all right, you're going to be okay. Get out of here. And then he hands me a $50 bill and he sends me out. And he wouldn't let me give it back. It's $50. I'm sure he's given way more to many other things, including his church. I'm sure you have as well. And thankfully, I've been blessed to be able to do so myself. I cannot tell you what that $50 meant to me. I experienced a sense of grace and care. It was a communication that you're not alone. It was a communication that others care about where you are. And, listen, Matthew, you don't need that pizza or that night out. But every now and then, it's okay to want some things and to treat yourself a little bit. And he says, now, this is what you got. You, you buy some pizza. <laughs> don't worry about what you're going to eat this weekend. Get through the weekend. And, and then show up at the dining hall on Monday, like you always do, you know. That expression... It was a beautiful thing. It was a witness to me. That moment, as small as that was, will live with me every moment of my life. I praise God for that. And I pray that I am more like that. I have a long way to go. I'm not as generous as I ought to be. And I'm not going to lie to myself and say that I am. I want to encourage you to step into generosity, to step away from greed, to deflate the inclinations towards greed that have scarcity mentality, that say, this is all mine, it shall be nothing else than mine, I will use it for whatever I will, and I don't care about anything else going on in the world. And instead, to turn and look out and say, Lord, I could have more. And I need to be a good steward of what you have blessed me with. I need to ensure that that me and mine have food on the table and a roof over our heads. But I also need to recognize that I am a recipient of generosity. Your generosity, Almighty God, and the generosity of others. And I am rich, even if I have just two small copper coins. I want to invite you to respond in generosity in the course of this week. And I also want to say, please consider the church in the midst of that. (laughs) And now, today, we are on Consecration Sunday. And Pastor Guitro, in a moment, will invite you to the giving of your pledges for next year. At the request of Finance Committee, and in my concurrence, we are passing the plate this morning. I know we haven't done that in years and years. If you don't have anything to put it in, or you've given online, that's great. It's okay. You are of equal value as the person who puts in the large sums. If you have but two copper coins, whatever you can do. And know God will be forgiving, and God is loving, and God still has a generous spirit to you. And we do as well. We are not judged by this church or by the Almighty God based upon the amount that we contribute, but that we would give from generous hearts. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we have a small video, short video for you to see now. Hi, it's Pastor Matthew. Your giving makes a difference at Centerville United Methodist Church. We want to show you how. 